Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the global financial crisis. And in the video uh, you've seen is one of my co-authors, uh, Dr. Matthew Greenwood Nimmo. And we are senior staff here at the Faculties of Business and Economics. And joining with the research is also a PhD student, uh, Jin Gong. Uh, so uh, in my talk, there are going to be three parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about the motivation or why we carry out our research. And in the second part, I'm going to uh, talk about how we went about our research to carry out, to answer the research questions. And in the last part, I'm going to briefly talk about who's going to benefit from our research. And the motivation of our research is this event. And this is one of the most important economic events in recent history. And the last time some of this thing that happened uh, was in 1930. And I bet a number of us here in this room was born then. And this is one in three generations event. And uh, uh, there are many ways to talk about this event. Uh, and I'm going to use some very uh, familiar concept with all of you to talk about this event. Uh, so I'm going to plot the major stock market in the, uh, in the world um, from 2006, which is before the crisis, and uh, up until 2012. And uh, possibly every single day when you go back, have dinners, and you listen to the TV news, you're going to you know, listen to like, what is the stock market today is like, you know, going up or going down everywhere in the world. And this is the U.S. stock market or the U.S. S&P 500. And um, what you can see is the collapse during the 2008 and 2009. The U.S. stock market index drops about 40%, right? Uh, so basically, uh, the crisis in 2008-2009 uh, start in the U.S., but it not only contained in the U.S., what it does is that it actually spread to the whole global financial system. And the second line that I plot here is the UK uh, stock market index. So basically, it's just like a twin, right? So they move very closely with each other. And not just only UK, and this is Germany. And basically, Germany is a major economy in the European Union. And the Germany financial market also follow the same pattern. And how about Australia? You know, very far away geographically. We, uh, we ex actually experience the same thing. Um, and Japan, which is another major economy in Asia, also experience the, th the same thing. So what you see is the collapse of the whole global financial system. And it starts from a single major financial market in the world, which is the US. Right? So what are the consequences of this collapse? I'm going to use another concept which is possibly familiar with uh, you here, uh, which is real GDP. And basically, it's just the output of any single economy. And this is the output of the US. So you can see uh, happen during the crisis is you have a collapse in the real output. And that collapse is about 10%, right? That 10% is about trillion of dollars. And to go with that output loss is millions of job loss. And with that millions of job lot, many people actually lost their saving. Many people actually lost their house because they will no, no longer be able to service their mortgage. And it's just not in the US. It's also in the UK, in Germany, and this is Australia. We were a lucky country, but I will talk about, about that a bit later. And this is um, Japan. But what you see is that the collapse in the global financial crisis have real consequences. It have output loss, it have job loss, right? Uh, Australia, we were a bit lucky. We didn't actually have a recession. We did have a blip in 2008, which is the last quarter of 2008, but we actually didn't have a recession. And a combination of several factors that like, we actually escaped the recession. Um, you know, we have a, rob a robust economy, and the government were really quick in trying to basically uh, tame uh, the negative influence from overseas. Um, now, um, so the people who experienced the crisis actually uh, bear the consequence of it. But not only those people, uh, also the future generation, right? So what about the future generation? So during the crisis, the US government had to bail out nearly a thousand uh, major institutions. And in the list here, you can actually see, uh, so the two major one is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And you have AIG, which is the major, one of the biggest uh, insurance company in the world. You have General Motors, you have Bank of America, Citigroup, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. So basically, the U.S. government had to bail out nearly a thousand major financial institutions. And this bailout actually cost the U.S. taxpayer n nearly $700 billion, right? So the government had to borrow to bail this financial institution and uh, major institution out. And who's going to pay for it? Future generation. 
the one who actually graded now. So once you start to earn your income to pay your tax, and you're gonna pay for this. So the consequence of the crisis is also intergenerational as well. So because of this phenomenal event and how uh, we are driven, right? What you can see from the, the crisis is that it starts in the US and it spread through the whole global financial system and also it caused the collapse of the global economy. So basically it is an interconnected network. So what we want to do is we want to build a network that can capture this phenomenon. Because if you can actually build the network, you can actually measure the spillover from one financial market to another and from one country to another. And if you actually know how to measure that spillover, policymaker, practitioner are going to have a better idea about how to counteract, again, the negative influence of this spillover. Right? So how can we capture the spillover uh, from one country to another, from one financial market to another? So what we do is we're going to build a network model and then we're gonna collect the data. And if you uh, were here earlier and you listened to the video, you know that it took us 18 months in order to collect the data and clean the data to be able to fit into the model and to see the result. And I'm gonna talk briefly about the model. In our model, we actually have a lot of major uh, economy in the world. In fact, we have 18. Uh, but to give you just a pictures of the model and how it works, uh, I'll just take an example of two, two models. We have country A and country B. And uh, to be able to capture the spillover from the financial sector to the economy, so we're gonna take two sectors in each economy. One is the financial sector and two is the public sector. So with just two countries, you actually have a four entity in the model and you can see how many, con how many connections uh, it has. Um, so the, uh, the intuition behind the model is that, say, for example, if you have a collapse in the financial sector of a country A, right, and then to avoid the free fall, the public sector of country A step in to bail out the financial uh, sectors of country A, right? And because of that, the public sector of country A become riskier, right? But it doesn't stop there. If financial sector in country B actually invest in the public sector of country A, for example, they buy the government bond of country A, and now the risks actually spread from the public sector of country A to the financial sector of the country B. And now the financial sector of country B become riskier and on the brink of collapse. The public sector of country B actually have to step in to bail out the financial sector of country B. And now basically it's the, it is an interconnected network uh, with feedback loop. So we want to build a model to be able to capture this spillover and we want to measure this spillover over time. And once you know, uh, you know, whether the spillover is strong or weak, we want to have a better policy in order to counter its negative influence. Okay, the next step is about the data. So we can see that there's going to be a lot of spillover from one country to another, from one financial sector to another. And we have to ask ourselves, what is the best data that we have to be able to capture this spillover, right? So at the end of the day, what is that, that actually spillover from one country, from one financial sector to another? And the answer is it's risk or to be exact, credit risks, right? And to be able to measure the credit risks, we're actually using the credit default swap contract. Does anyone in here know what is CDS or credit default swap? Yep. Uh, so basically, um, you can think of it as an insurance premium, right? Um, so if you buy a new house, you're gonna have to buy an insurance for that house, right? And if that house is in a very risky area like prone to flooding and termite and bushfire, then the insurance premium for that house is going to be much higher than the average house, right? So the same thing here. Uh, so you're going to have the, like once you invest in a financial institution, you're going to buy the insurance for that investment, right? And the riskier the financial institution, the higher the risk premium. So we're going to use credit before swap in order to measure the risk. And here is the CDS for the financial sector uh, of the five major economy that I, I put at the beginning of the talk. You can see that before the crisis happened, basically, they are very safe, right? So basically, the premium is actually very low. But once the financial crisis happened, right, so premium jump up. Basically, what it indicated is that this financial sector become very, very risky, and it actually spread from one financial sector to another, right? And this just only the CDS for the financial sector, and this is for the public sector, or basically 
the government. And what you can see, because the government of this country bail out their financial sector, the government also become riskier. And you can see the insurance premium or kind of the CDS threat for this government jump up substantially during the GFC and actually still remain high up until 2012. So basically, we're going to use this uh, data to fit in now to a network model, and now we're going to see some of the results. So this is the, um, basically a snapshot of the results at the beginning of the crisis. And uh, these are the 18 country, major countries in our model. So uh, there are two things on these uh, pictures. So the north side or the circle, the bigger is the circle, the more important the domestic condition to that economy. And the edge or the line is to capture the spillover or the connection between the country. The thicker is the line, the stronger the connection. But you want to see nothing from this because there's too many, right? So we're going to do a zoom in. So we're going to have a pictures. We pick one country. The country that we pick is Portugal, which is a very minor, small economy, but actually play an important role in the GFC and also in the following European debt crisis, you know, the peripheral country. So this is the before and the during the GFC. And the same thing, like the note uh, um, represent the importance of the domestic condition and the line or the edge denote the connection, right? So before the GFC, you can see two things from these pictures. The first thing is that before the GFC, the domestic condition actually is more important because the circle or the note is much bigger, right? During the GFC, the note become much smaller in every single case. What it means is that now overseas condition spill over into your country and become very, very important. And the other thing you can also see is the line. It's become much thicker. You, can actually, ha you actually have more line from Portugal outward and inward. What it does is that the spillover from other countries to Portugal becomes stronger and also from Portugal spillover back to the other countries is stronger. So you can see that like during the GFC, the network become highly interconnected. And this is why the collapse in just the US actually spread throughout the global economy. Now this is just a snapshot, one before and one after during the GFC. And I'm gonna play a video so we can actually trace the network through time. But because there's too many results, so I'm gonna just only give you uh, two types of spillover. On the left hand side is the spillover from the financial sector to the public sector, okay? And on the right hand side is the spillover among the public sector. So before I play the two video, I'm gonna give you a hint first. First, uh, the, the darker the color, the stronger the connection, yeah? And the lighter the color, the weaker the connection. And the several hint before I play the video is that Remember, during the GFC, the public sector actually bailed out the financial sector, right? And because of that, the spillover from the financial sector to the public sector become very strong initially. And then once the public sector absorbed the risks from the financial sector, the public sector become riskier and it spread among them. So first you're gonna see that increase in the, the darker color on the left-hand side and then on the right-hand side when it spread. Okay, now I'm gonna play the two video. So this is pre-GFC, you don't have much connection among the country. And you can see the date, which is now October 2007. Now the onset of the financial crisis. Look at the left-hand side. Now this is Lehman Brothers collapse, and you can see like a lot stronger connection. And now it actually spread onto the right-hand side. Now it spread among the public sector. And now you no longer have the spillover from, are we still playing? You no longer have the spillover among the, from financial sector to public, se public sector, but among the public sector. It doesn't look as dark as on our screen here. But anyway. Okay, um, there are many results from the research and we actually put all of the results onto our website and now we're gonna have a tour of the website. Okay, so basically um, all the results from the research were put on the website so anyone can assess the student, the practitioner or politician or like policy maker can actually um, look at. So this is the network and you can actually play around with this network, right? So you can pick a country and you see the spillover from one country to another and you can pick another country like this and you can actually select the day you want to look at. For example, let's select the 
2008 and September when you have the Lehman Brothers collapse. Okay, we will pick one, any country, so from the US. So this is like when you see um, 2008 when you have a collapse of the financial sectors in the US and this is the US and start to spill over to all the other country. And um, so at the end of the talk, we have some iPad, iPad outside, so you can play around with the network, or alternatively, you can go home, log onto the website, and play around with the network. Not just only this result, but we hold, say the heat map, like we did before, you can select different types of spillover among the financial sector, from the financial sector to the public sector, and you can play this, say, video. So you can play this video. Alternatively, um, we have, this is the, some indicators of the spillover um, over time in the network. Okay. So the next question is like, why actually we do our research, right? And who are gonna be the beneficiaries of our research? Uh, so as a researchers, uh, we are always interested in uncover new thing, uncover a new phenomenon, and try to have a better understanding of this phenomenon, like the crisis, right? Why it happened, and it affects the lives of so many people, you know, who lost their job, who has lost their house. So we want to understand this phenomenon. Um, so the beneficiaries of this research are going to be us first, the researcher, because we're going to have a better understanding of this phenomenon, and then it's going to be the community, right? The practitioner, the policymaker who want to have a better understanding of the network, of the spillover over time. And once you have this evidence, you can have a better policy in order to counter any negative influence of this spillover, you know? And then, of course, uh, last but not least, yep. because in here, we do both teaching and research. So, of course, students are gonna be the beneficiaries of our research. Because with new research, we're going to have a new understanding and we're going to incorporate into our teaching to disseminate the new finding of the research and the student here are going to be beneficial, uh, you know, going to benefit from the result of the new research. And you remember at the beginning of the talk, one of the co-authors on this project actually is a PhD student. So with that, he also have a better understanding of the economy of the global network and he's gonna go out, like say, to have a new job, then start to use this knowledge with his new job. Yeah. And that's the end of my talk. All the very best and enjoy. And remember, uh, when you go to uni, it's just a once in a lifetime experience for you all. So remember to enjoy. <laughs>